front runner in the Conservative leadership race says he will take part in the televised BBC debate next week. And in an interview today, Mr Johnson says the EU withdrawal agreement could be renegotiated, but he insists we must leave Europe by the end of October. It's absolutely crucial to prepare for no deal. And I don't share the, the deep pessimism of some people about the consequences of no deal. That's not to say that I don't think there will be uh, some difficulties that need to be addressed. The Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, pulls out of the leadership race. It's not clear which of the six remaining candidates he'll now support. Well, we'll have the very latest on the race for the leadership and the other main stories on BBC News at five. Hello, good evening. Boris Johnson has responded to criticism that he's avoiding media scrutiny in the Conservative leadership contest by agreeing to take part in a televised debate with his rivals next week. But he still says he won't join a Channel 4 debate on Sunday. He claims he wants to avoid a cacophony of blue-on-blue -blue candidates. Well, meanwhile, the Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, has announced that he is dropping out of the leadership contest after the first ballot. Mr Hancock was in sixth place with 20 votes, with Boris Johnson, the standout winner, with 114 votes. Well, there are now six candidates going through to the second ballot next week. Our political correspondent Chris Mason reports from Westminster. Boris Johnson hopes he'll well, soon be Johnson. moving house. His campaign to be Prime Minister is well organised and cautious, keen to minimise moments where he could slip Are up. you afraid of scrutiny or a gaffe, Mr Johnson? But his team also know avoiding proper public scrutiny entirely would be very risky, giving critics a stronger case to question his legitimacy if he does win. There's no commitment to Channel 4's debate on Sunday, but a yes to the BBC's on Tuesday. In the past, when you've had loads of, of candidates, it can be slightly cacophonous. And I think the public have had a quite a lot of blue-on-blue uh, -blue action, frankly, over the last three years. We don't necessarily need a lot more of that. All the other candidates spent the morning saying Mr Johnson must take part in TV debates, including Channel 4's this weekend. Public hustings is not the same as the scrutiny of the media, the scrutiny of TV debates. This is about the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. I mean, what would Churchill say if uh, someone who wants to be Prime Minister of the United Kingdom is hiding away from the media, not taking part in these big occasions? And the real judgment the members of Parliament have to make is who do they want going up against Boris in the final two? And there's only one way they can judge that, which is by seeing Boris on the stage against the other candidates. Enter next, the former Brexit secretary, Dominic Raab. Nothing says a politician doing a photo opportunity more than a fluorescent jacket. I'm looking forward on building up some momentum and in particular, testing the vision, the ideas and the policies of all the candidates in these first TV debates on Sunday. It's a great opportunity for me. And as for Matt Hancock, it's lights, camera and the end of the action for him. His attempt to be Prime Minister is over. Where I have put myself forward as a candidate focused on the future, the parties understandably focus very much on the here and now and how we get through uh, Brexit in the next few months. And so I've decided to withdraw from the contest. And also, I really want... And take a look at this. Mr Hancock socking it to his former rival Dominic Raab. This is what a feminist looks like. Mr Raab has said he doesn't see himself as a feminist. This contest is hotting up. Here's the prize they're chasing. Moving in in just over a month. Chris Mason, BBC News at Westminster. Well, our political correspondent Jonathan Blake's at Westminster now. Uh, so, Jonathan, Boris Johnson will join the televised debate next week after all. Was the pressure on him to do so pretty much overwhelming? The pressure was building and the criticism was only increasing from his fellow candidates in this race over his apparent lack of enthusiasm or refusal until now to confirm that he would take part. We saw a joint letter signed by all of them intending to put pressure 
on him. Uh, so he's clearly decided that this is the moment to confirm that he will take part in that BBC debate next Tuesday, if not the one on Channel 4 on Sunday. And whereas up until now, he and his campaign have clearly been happy to stand back, consolidate their lead, make sure they have the support they need among Conservative MPs and allow the other candidates to kind of squabble and debate amongst themselves who will be in second place and join him in the final round. Uh, it seems they've taken the view that an empty chair, an empty podium in that debate just simply wouldn't be a good look and now is the time to engage. But remember, by Tuesday, it will be a narrower field. At least one candidate will be eliminated almost certainly in the next round of voting on Tuesday before that debate in the evening. And what is the latest on the leadership race? Uh, a lot of talk that it's going to be the final two are going to be Boris Johnson plus one other. Is it any clearer who that one other would be? No, not today. Uh, we have one fewer candidates to uh, consider. Matt Hancock has withdrawn, as you heard in Chris's report just now. So there are 20 MPs whose votes are up for grabs, as well as Mr Hancock's himself and his endorsement, which will count for something in this race. So I'm sure all the other candidates will be hitting the phones this weekend and into next week ahead of that next secret ballot among MPs next Tuesday when the bar will be considerably higher. 33 votes needed to survive that next round of voting. So those who supported Matt Hancock in the first round, their phones will be buzzing across the weekend. All right, Jonathan, thank you very much indeed. Jonathan Blake there. A memorial service has been held to mark the second anniversary of the Grenfell Tower fire in which 72 people lost their lives. Later, survivors and the bereaved will lay a wreath at the foot of the tower in West London and hold a vigil to remember those who lost their lives. But two years on from the disaster, three quarters of tall buildings in England with cladding categorised as unsafe still have not had it removed or modified. Sarah Campbell reports. Lit up in memory of all those who died, and for a community still living with the scars of the fire. Covered in a screen, but the remains of the tower still dominate this corner of London. Two years on, the community has come together once again to remember. Nabil Shuker lost six members of his family that night. It's, it's to make sure that they're now never forgotten. It's also to so that we all um, give our prayers to all the 72 members, get in the community all together um, and ensuring um, that we will stick by each other year after year until we get the justice and what we're looking for. Sainam Chikan, Liana Chikan. Whole families Fatima gone, Chikan. young and old. Mary Mendy. All 72 were named this morning in St Helens Church in a service described as of remembrance and resilience. Forever in our hearts. But I know a change is gonna come. At 12 noon, 72 seconds of silence. The public inquiry into what happened is ongoing and will be for some time. The frustrations of many were voiced here today. It is, nor should be, a matter of national shame that Grenfell Tower was allowed to get to the state or a small fire in a faulty fridge on the fourth floor could cause so much devastation. But two years on, we seem still no clearer on where responsibility lies and where buildings across the country are still covered in cladding similar to that which seems to have caused the fire here. This was a service by and for a community whose members have tried so hard to help each other over the last two years. Sarah Campbell, BBC News. And we will have more on the memorial commemorations after half past five.
Public Health England says two more patients are now known to have died after eating pre-packaged sandwiches and salads linked to a listeria outbreak in hospitals. Our health editor Hugh Pym is with me now. Uh, Hugh, bring us the latest. What, what more do we know? Well, Ben, a week ago we learnt that there were six cases of uh, listeria uh, linked to hospital patients being given these sandwiches and salads which uh, carried the bacteria and three people had died. Now that had been looking back over, uh, going back to the beginning of May, there were three who were seriously ill. Now we've learned that one of those who was seriously ill uh, as of last week has died since then and Public Health England has identified another death. Again, going back several weeks, looking at all the records and establishing that the death was caused uh, by listeria. So we now have a situation where there are nine cases and there have been five deaths and we understand it's at seven trusts in England. Uh, last week uh, there were two identified, one in Manchester and one in Liverpool. We don't know the other five, but they are dotted around different parts of mm. England, apparently. So are they still going through the records, in which case more details might emerge? Well, that's right, because deaths uh, could have been recorded for different reasons. There could have been a sepsis situation, blood poisoning, which had been caused by the listeria, and the cause of death hadn't been known at the time. So Public Health England's had to do quite a lot of detective work, going back over several weeks, looking at what's happened in hospitals where sandwiches were supplied by the company to establish whether the death could have been caused actually by listeria from that source. Uh, it's important to note that the sandwiches in question being made by the company, they're not being produced anymore. So the source of this uh, outbreak, uh, if you like, has been contained. But uh, in terms of what more may emerge, we, we simply don't know. PHE, Public Health England, are saying there's no risk to the public, uh, but they are continuing to monitor the situation very carefully at hospitals around England. OK, Hugh, thank you very much. Hugh Pym, our health editor. Our latest headlines now on BBC News. The front runner in the Tory leadership race, Boris Johnson, says he will take part in the BBC TV debate next week as he tells the BBC that he believes the EU withdrawal agreement can be renegotiated. Two years on from the Grenfell Tower fire, survivors and relatives of the 72 dead come together today to remember the tragedy. And as you've just been hearing, two more hospital patients die in an outbreak of listeria linked to pre-packed sandwiches. Two carers have been found guilty of murdering a vulnerable 19-year-old woman whose body has never been found. Edward Kearney and Avril Jones killed Margaret Fleming in Inverclyde in December 1999 or the following month. Suspicions were aroused only in 2016 after a benefits claim made by Jones on Margaret Fleming's behalf. Well, the couple will be sentenced next month, as Lorna Gordon now reports. Edward Kearney and Avril Jones, the supposed carers of a vulnerable young woman who instead became her killers. In a BBC interview before they were charged, they denied Margaret Fleming had been harmed. Did either of you harm Margaret? No. No. So Margaret is alive and well and she is has come to no harm. That's right. no harm unless she's got harm in the last couple of weeks. But Margaret, a quiet, shy girl, had come to harm. The teenager had moved here into the couple's home in Inverkip on the Clyde after her father died. On one occasion, she was seen here with duct tape round her wrists, on another with drain pipes covering her arms up to her shoulders. Margaret was last seen alive just before Christmas 1999. Police believe that in her final months, she was effectively a prisoner, treated like a slave, neglected, deprived of food, murdered. The couple made fantastical claims to try and cover up their crimes, that Margaret was scared of the police and had run away, that she'd left to become a gang master, that she was a frustrated spy. It was left to one of her former teachers to talk about the real Margaret, an isolated teenager who nobody was looking out for, who disappeared without anyone even realising she was gone. You know, I taught Margaret for two years and I'm here speaking about her as a person and I'm the only person who, that we've been able to find who really remembers her and I think that's one of the saddest things that this wee girl has just been forgotten. Forgotten for almost 20 years. Now, Margaret Fleming's murderers finally brought to justice. Lorna Gordon, BBC News at the High Court in Glasgow. Well, shortly after the couple were convicted, the senior investigating officer 
spoke on the steps of the courthouse. It's horrific and the conditions in which you lived were utterly disgusting and uninhabitable. For Kelly and Jones to continue the charade that, was still, that she was still alive for all these years is absolutely abhorrent, with one of the reasons being for financial gain. We'll never know just how Margaret was killed. What we do know is that she lived her last, last days in what can only be described as a living hell. She must have felt that she was alone in the world with no one coming to help her, which is just absolutely heartbreaking to think of. Chuka Amuna, who left the Labour Party earlier this year to help form the Change UK Party, has now joined the Liberal Democrats. Warning, the following pictures do contain some flash photography. Well, the former shadow business secretary said he was absolutely delighted to have joined the Liberal Democrats. Earlier, he admitted he had massively underestimated the difficulty of setting up a new party. I think there is huge cause to be optimistic and hopeful about the future. This is the most exciting time in my lifetime, I think, in many respects, for the progressive liberal politics that we have in our country. The local and European elections illustrated that millions of voters agree that the two main parties in British politics are broken. The tectonic plates are clearly shifting. And I think the public is now more in favour of upending the two-party system that, than at any time in my lifetime. Chukramuna there. Let's go back to uh, one of our main stories this evening and the second anniversary of the Grenfell Tower fire tragedy. And there's still a lot of concern over what changes have been made to ensure fire safety in other tall buildings. The latest government figures show that two years on from Grenfell, three quarters of tall buildings with cladding categorised as unsafe still have not had it removed or modified, with work yet to be started on more than half. Uh, well, let's speak to Jonathan O'Neill, who's Managing Director of the Fire Protection Association, uh, the UK's national fire safety organisation, and one of 28 similar national bodies worldwide. Uh, he joins us from Worcester. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. So what, what do you make of that figure that um, two years on, three quarters of tall buildings uh, in England with cladding that's unsafe still hasn't been sorted out? It's appalling, really. Uh, it's just, it's embarrassing, really, to be sitting here two years after such a dreadful incident such as Grenfell. Um, and to, as you quite rightly reported, what, you know, what has changed in fire safety? Well, apart from a ban on combustible materials in tall buildings, which was brought in 12 months ago, nothing's changed at all. Um, we, we still haven't had a building regulations review uh, for that. That's now for the last 14 years. Um, and we never thought, and many of us in the fire safety community never thought that the combustible ban went far enough anyway. It's all right, you know, tall buildings are all well and good, but there are also lots of other high-risk buildings um, in uh, the built environment, such as schools and hospitals and care homes. Um, and we saw so on the weekend, so graphically embarking, a, a, a six-storey um, block of flats go up exceptionally quickly with combustible balconies um, on the outside. In, if that had happened at night, who knows what would have happened? Luckily, it happened during the day and everyone managed to escape. So without being alarmist, um, there could be another Grenfell Tower tragedy. Well, if you say you, you concentrated, I think your, your piece started with what's changed. Well, say apart from that combustible ban, nothing has changed. There's no requirement for sprinklers in tall buildings. Again, something which has been called on not by just the Fire Protection Association, but the, the National Fire Chiefs Council, the Association of British Insurers, um, the Royal Institute of British Architects. Everybody is trying to, to lobby the government to say that this change is desperately needed, and yet it falls on deaf ears. I think all of us were expecting to have some announcement before today, but it seems extraordinary, say two years after the worst loss of life in fire since the Second World War in the UK, that we have not had that so little change in our fire safety regulations. It's extraordinary, really. Well, and, and why is that, do you think? Because after, straight after Grenfell, of course, in the days after Grenfell, there was so much wringing of hands and everybody saying this can never be allowed to happen again. But why do you think the authorities have been so slow to, to, to bring in these changes? It's a really good question. I mean, I think I was not alone in uh, fire safety professionals writing to various ministers, including the Prime Minister, 
in the days immediately after the um, Grenfell tragedy to offer as much assistance as we could, as we could muster uh, to see a full building regulations review in the UK. As I said, it hadn't been done at that point for 12 years. Um, the, the, the built environment has changed so substantially in the last 12 years, it's quite extraordinary. We see so many more combustible materials in the built environment. We know that buildings generally react quite differently in fire than they did a decade ago. Yet still, we have no uh, building regulations change. Um, we've ha we had a call for evidence, which was, which was made just before Christmas. Um, and again, we still heard nothing from the government. I, I, I understand the government are tied up with other things at the moment, but this needs to be number one priority. You'd have thought that with such uh, a, an event such as Grenfell, we would have at least had some serious government action by now. It's, it's a mystery to me and all fellow fire safety professionals in the UK. And you've mentioned another, a number of things that you want to see done, um, you know, cladding sorted out, staircases, detectors, sensors. What, what, is there one that is the most urgent, the most important that needs to be addressed before everything else? The easiest thing to do is, to, is for the government to legislate very, very quickly on putting sprinklers in all high-risk buildings in the UK. We've had some watered-down uh, legislation recently proposed um, on sprinklers in schools. Um, we, we've had the tragedy of, of care of multiple deaths in care homes. We've had Grenfell Tower and yet still no sprinkler protection um, in, in, in all but the, the very tallest residential buildings in the UK. 30 metres or 10 storeys is just too high. Um, we need to be going down much lower, so maybe to, to six storeys. And in Scotland, they're even proposing it to be even lower. Jonathan O'Neill from the Fire Protection Association, thank you very much indeed for being with us. Thank you. The World Health Organisation is meeting to decide whether the Ebola outbreak in eastern Congo, which has killed around 1,400 people, should be declared an international public health emergency. This week, the virus spread to neighbouring Uganda, where two people died after arriving from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uganda has banned public gatherings in the Kasisi district, which borders Congo, and has vaccinated many frontline health workers. The WikiLeaks founder, Julian Assange, has been ordered to face a full extradition hearing next February. Mr Assange appeared via video link at Westminster Magistrates Court after the United States requested his extradition to face trial on computer hacking charges. His legal team said the charges were an outrageous and full frontal assault on journalistic rights. Iran has strongly rejected U.S. accusations that it was behind attacks on two oil tankers off its coast in the Gulf of Oman yesterday. Washington released a video which it said showed Iranian special forces removing an unexploded mine from the side of one of the ships. Well, it is the second such attack on tankers using the strategically crucial waterway which separates Iran from the Arabian Peninsula. In an interview with Fox News, President Trump said... He was ready to launch talks with Iran whenever it was ready, but he added that he was in no rush. Jonathan Beale reports. Is this proof of Iran trying to remove evidence from one of the two tankers targeted in the Gulf? America says their video shows Iran's revolutionary guard taking away an unexploded mine, which the US believes they'd planted on one of the ships. The U.S. Navy also released these photos taken earlier of the same ship, one arrow pointing to where they believe a mine exploded and the other where they think the mine was still attached. America has no doubt Iran was behind these attacks on a critical shipping route. Britain says it'll study the evidence, but it too is pointing the finger at Iran. We have no reason uh, not to believe the American assessment and our instinct is to believe it because they're our closest ally and we are very worried about the situation in Iran. Iran still denying it. This morning in a tweet, their foreign minister accused the US of jumping to make allegations without a shred of evidence. What is clear is that tensions are rising. With Iran angered by America's re-imposition of sanctions over its nuclear program and the US beefing up its military presence in the region. Neither side says they want a war, but the United States is stressing it's ready to defend its interests. Jonathan Beale, BBC News. 
Flood warnings are still in place in parts of the Midlands and northwest of England as heavy rain continues to cause problems. About 400 passengers were stranded on a train near Corby for eight hours after a landslide caused by flooding blocked the line. And a military helicopter was called in to help shore up a riverbank in Lincolnshire after heavy rain. Bill Mackey has the details. The RAF has spent the night trying to repair a breach in flood defences on the river Steeping, which has caused severe flooding in Wainfleet to more than 70 homes, and that number could rise. Police say it's one of the most challenging emergencies that the county's ever faced. It's been three days of, of pain uh, for those communities in Wainfleet. Uh, to discover that your house has been flooded is, of course, really upsetting. They've been fantastic. Some of the heroic efforts by those fire and rescue officers, a real challenging operation here in Lincolnshire. <laughs> Rail passengers had to be rescued near Corby last night after first one, and then a second train became trapped by flooding and a landslide. It's been a week when it seemed like it would never stop raining, which would be less of a problem if it weren't the middle of June. It is unusual and we've got a lot of people uh, by rivers who, who perhaps wouldn't normally be on holiday, camping, that kind of stuff. And, you know, what we're urging is people, if you are, if you are near rivers, they are very high, they're very swollen, they're reacting very quick to rain, increased vigilance, you know, be very careful about your surroundings. The rain is easing off and the forecast is a little bit better, but the rivers are still filling up and the peak here in Worcester isn't expected until late tomorrow afternoon. Which means the disruption is going to continue for a few more days. And those with weekend plans will just have to make the best of it, which will suit some more than others. Bill Mackey. Well, uh, let's pick up on that and uh, see what the weather is going to do over the weekend and how it might affect your weekend plans. Some serious flooding there, Louise. Yeah, Ben, it's been a miserable week, hasn't it? Now, some of us have been desperate for some rain, but it's been too much in a very short space of time. But there are glimmers of good news as we move through the weekend. And next week certainly is going to be better. I've actually found some sunshine for some of us today. It's been a little better, as well as you can see in West Berkshire. So some sunny spells and feeling quite pleasant in the sunshine today. There has been some showers, though, and generally speaking, quite a lot of cloud across the country. But the showers have been fairly fragmented as they move their way through the Midlands up to the eastern half of England and some across Scotland and into Northern Ireland. Now, as we go through the night, this batch out to the west will intensify a little and push into western fringes. So a real west-east divide first thing for our Saturday morning. The best of any drier, brighter weather to start our weekend is certainly going to be across the eastern half of the UK. Clouding over a little into the afternoon as that weak weather front starts to edge its way slowly eastwards. A band of showers and cloud, really, by the middle of the afternoon. So if you keep the sunshine, you'll see highs of 19 degrees, a few Scattered showers up into the northwest. Drier and warmer still, though, as we move into the early half of next week. Hello again, you're watching BBC News with me, Ben Brown, our latest headlines. The leading contender for the Conservative Party leadership race, Boris Johnson, says he will take part in a televised debate on the BBC on Tuesday. The health secretary, Matt Hancock, drops out of the leadership race. So far, he hasn't said which of the remaining six candidates he'll give his backing to. Two years after the Grenfell Tower fire, a service of remembrance is held for the 72 people who lost their lives. Two more hospital patients die in an outbreak of listeria linked to pre-packed sandwiches. Heavy rain continues to cause problems in parts of the Midlands, Eastern England and the northwest of England with flood warnings still in place. And Hugh Woodencroft's got all the latest sport for us and there's plenty of it today. Hugh? Uh, yes, indeed, there is. See you then, Hugh. Thank you very much. Let's take you back now to the commemorations taking place on the second anniversary of the Grenfell fire in which 72 people died. Well, it's clearly a very emotional day for many people, including Nabil Shuker, who was not in the building at the time, but did lose six members of his family. Well, he's been explaining why marking the anniversary is so important to him. It's, it's to make sure that they're now never forgotten. It's also to, so that we all um, give our prayers to all the 72 members, get in the community all together, 
um, and ensuring um, that we will stick by each other year after year until we get the justice and what we're looking for. You don't believe it's happened. Um, you can't believe it. It's hard. It's very hard to believe that it's happened. Um, even though you know and you've seen death certificates and everything else, it's you find it very hard to accept, um, to believe, to you know. It's 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 not. It happened. You know it happened, but you don't believe it. You know, and you don't want to accept it, but you have to accept it. So, you know, you're in that kind of limbo situation. Nabil Shukair there. Well, uh, our correspondent Alice Bandrakavi is at Notting Hill Methodist Church uh, from where a silent march will be starting a little later on this evening. So, Alice, two years on, how would you assess the mood there around Grenfell today? Well, today the mood is calm, it's quiet, it's considered. Uh, people have been gradually trickling in here for this evening's events. Um, but the commemoration really started last night at about midnight, one o'clock this morning, uh, when survivors and the bereaved uh, let off a bunch of green balloons um, to remember those who perished. And uh, today there will be more commemorations, but uh, the people who've been arriving uh, are wearing green. Lots of people are wearing green. People have sort of adopted green to symbolize the tragedy of Grenfell. The street lights are green, local children have been making bunting all in green and they've been streaming in, bringing in toys, flowers uh, to remember those who died exactly two years ago. And Alice, what's going to be happening later on this evening? Well, shortly at about quarter past six there will be a, a private wreath laying ceremony. That will be happening over my shoulder actually at the base of the tower. Um, and that will be shown across screens which have been positioned in the area so that everybody can see what's happening. But only a, a fixed number of people have in, been invited to that private event. And that will be followed uh, at seven um, by a multi-faith vigil here outside Notting Hill Methodist Church, which has been, become something of a focal point for the local community. That will be taking place. People have been rehearsing here uh, because there will be some performances, some singing, um, some prayers. And then later on at 7.45, as you mentioned, there will be this silent walk. Now, the silent walk has been happening every month since, uh, pretty much since the fire happened. Uh, but of course, this month's uh, silent walk will be particularly poignant because, of course, it is the two year anniversary. And that is the opportunity for the campaigners um, to apply pressure on the powers that be. Um, they're calling for justice for Grenfell. They want to know uh, the answers to their questions. Many questions left unanswered. Um, and I expect that there will be a lot of people at that silent walk this evening, uh, which happens, uh, takes place here outside the Methodist Church. And it goes all along in a circle uh, right up to where the fire actually happened. That'll be happening uh, within the next two hours, Ben. OK, Alice, thank you very much. That's Alice Bandrew Karavi there uh, at the... Notting Hill Methodist Church. Back now to our top story that uh, Boris Johnson has responded to criticism that he's avoiding media scrutiny in the Tory leadership contest and he's now agreed to take part in a televised debate with his rivals next week on BBC television. Boris Johnson's also been giving an extensive interview uh, to my colleague Mark Mardell on Radio 4's The World at One. So let's have a listen to what he had to say about the possibility of a no-deal Brexit. I don't aim for no deal. I don't want no deal as the outcome of the talks. Of course not. I don't want us to leave with a, a WTO uh, solution as our, my number one priority. That is not what I'm aiming for. But I certainly don't think that some of the uh, promises of doom and disaster are true. And I think that you'll find plenty of people who will uh, give you a very different verdict about, uh, about uh, what no deal would mean. And indeed, our preparations, our preparations are very extensive because I think that we can get to a situation in which uh, we are able to leave smoothly with an orderly managed Brexit. And that's what we should be aiming for. 
Uh, but the only way to make sure that we convince our partners that we're determined to get that outcome is to prepare for no deal. And I think, and I think people do understand that. And I think, I, no, I think on the contrary, I think it is perfectly realistic and there, are, there is a clear way that the now uh, effectively defunct withdrawal agreement can be disaggregated, the good bits of it can be uh, taken out. I think, for instance, one thing that would be uh, immediately right to do, and which I suggested straight after the referendum result three years ago, I think what we should do is take the provisions on citizenship, uh, take the offer that we make to the 3.2 million European EU citizens in our country and do it in a, in a super erogatory way, just do it uh, of our own accord, pass it through Parliament. Then there's the question, obviously, of the ongoing court cases, the EU officials' pension rights and, uh, uh, the, and lesser matters, which I think can also be, be dealt with. And oh, absolutely, Mark, the fundamental uh, flaw in the current withdrawal agreement, which everybody understands, is the Irish backstop arrangements. And don't forget that that effect, that prison, that uh, Hobson's choice, which it presents any uh, UK government with, of uh, either being unable to, to set our own uh, economic and political destiny or... Uh, having to give up the government of, of Northern Ireland. Everybody understands the, the flaws in the, in the backstop, and MPs on all sides of the House condemned it. The solution is obvious, and it's something that, it's something that actually united MPs on, uh, on all sides of the House when they voted for the Brady Amendment. Now, of course, our friends and partners uh, over the channel will say, this is impossible, we can't do this, it's a unicorn, and, and so on, and I, I perfectly understand that. But I think actually there is a solution to be arrived at in that area, and we should work very hard for it. And, and, and in the meantime, and in the meantime, it's absolutely crucial to prepare for no deal. And I don't share the, the deep pessimism of some people about the consequences of no deal. That's not to say that I don't think there will be uh, some difficulties that need to be addressed, and we must make sure that we can address them. But unless we get ready, and unless we show fortitude and determination, uh, I don't think that we will carry conviction in Brussels about, uh, about the deal we want to do. Uh, Boris Johnson there speaking to Mark Mardell on Radio 4. Uh, do you have any questions for the Conservative leadership candidates? Because, as we've mentioned, on Tuesday, BBC One is going to be hosting a live election hustings between all the candidates, and one of them will be the new Prime Minister. Um, as we've mentioned, Boris Johnson will be taking part in that. So email have your say at bbc.co.uk with your question. Don't forget to include your name and contact number if you're interested in asking it live on the night from your local BBC studio. Look at our latest headlines now on BBC News. The front runner in the Tory leadership race, Boris Johnson, has said that he will take part in that BBC television debate next week. Two years on from the Grenfell Tower fire, survivors and relatives of the 72 dead come together today to remember the tragedy. Two more hospital patients die in an outbreak of listeria linked to pre-packed sandwiches. Right, let's give you a taste of what's going to be in Sports Day at half past six tonight. And coming up in Sports Day on BBC News, we'll have the latest from the women's...